Hello, my name is John Lee and I'm the president of Alpha Training and Consulting and I have a true passion for preparing students for ASQ certification exams. I love preparing students for ASQ certification exams. But today we're going to go over practice exam questions for the Six Sigma Black Belt exam. And we're taking those questions right out of the Certified Six Sigma Black Belt Primer. Uh, which comes from Quality Council of Indiana, and they gave us permission to use these questions. So we greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Quality Council of Indiana. We so much like their primers that we actually made them part of our class. So what you do is you take all our lectures, all our exams, and then when you're finished with that, you review the primer, and we go over all the end of chapter questions with you in a video like this one. Now, if you're interested in that class at all, that prep class, just go to www.asqcssbb for Certified Six Sigma Black Belt. Again, that's asqcssbb.com. It's a website dedicated to nothing but the ASQ certification called Six Sigma Black Belt. I think I have over 10 videos embedded in there. It answers any question you may have concerning the Black Belt certification. All right, let's get started on those questions. All right, here we are back at question six, and I'll read that again. Increasing performance in a lean Six Sigma corporation, meaning one and a half sigma shift, from three sigma to four sigma would reduce defects per million by a factor of what? All right, and the table you'll need in order to solve this problem is in the appendix, and in my revision, it's page three, and it's Six Sigma failure rates. And uh, with a one and a half sigma process shift, or with no process. Now you can do it on the Z table, uh, but let me read the question again here. Increasing performances in a Lean Six Sigma Corporation. As soon as it says Lean Six Sigma Corporation, you know they're going to take into account the one and a half sigma shift. And that's why you'll use uh, this table right here. You'll be using the one with the shift, not with no shift. Now remember, you could also do this by uh, going to your Z table and what what they're at three sigma and four sigma and take three sigma subtract one and a half from it and then uh, which would give us one and a half sigmas that you'd look up in the Z table and four sigma and look up uh, two and a half a Z of two and a half would give you the same answer as this table here but this table makes it a little quicker and of course we like to go fast so let's look at three sigma here and it tells us. 3 sigma with the 1.5 sigma shift is 66,810.63 parts per million. So I'm going to write that down. 66,810.63 parts per million. Okay, that's for 3 sigma. Now we'll go to 4 sigma column here, and there it is, 6,209.7, 6,209.7 parts per million. And so now let's go to the whiteboard and calculate this out and get the correct answer. All right, so here we are at the whiteboard. To get the factor, we take the 66,810.63 parts per million, and uh, remember that was for three sigma, divided by 6,209.7 parts per million. Remember, this was for the four sigma process. So let's divide that out and see what our factor of improvement is. Here we go, 66,810.63 divided by 6,209.7 equals and so we're a factor of 10.76. Now ASQ just kind of rounds things off a lot of times, so this may just, the correct answer may be 10. But let's go back to our question sheet and uh, see if uh, we can find the correct answer. All right, here we are back at question six, and I'll read that again. Increasing performance in a lean Six Sigma corporation, meaning one and a half sigma shift, from three sigma to four sigma would reduce defects per million by a factor of what? There it is, it was 10.7 something. If there was an 11, I'd pick it, but there's not. 10 is the closest thing to it. So I'm going to go with C, and uh, that's uh, question six uh, is C, so that is correct. All right, here we are at question 16. From an upper management perspective, what has been the principal motivating factor in embracing Lean Six Sigma? 
Well, upper management, what are they, uh, what is the biggest reason that upper management loses their job? It's because they do not meet their financial goals. So they have to make that happen. They have to create profit. So it's all going to be about, I see this right here, bottom line results. Whenever you see upper management, you should think bottom line results. They have to make those numbers what they need to be to keep everyone happy or they won't have a job. So A, bottom line results, I'm sure is the correct answer. Market share growth. Now, if you grow market share but you don't increase profits, you're still in trouble. Defect reductions, I mean, that's all good. But this is a subcategory to bottom line results. All these could be uh, subcategories to A. So A is the most general because all these could be correct. Customer focus, we know ASQ likes customer focus. But if it doesn't create bottom line results, upper management's in trouble. So just remember, if it says upper management, you should think, oh, they have to make money. Here we are at question seven. A Six Sigma project requires $23,000 of initial investment and the training costs of 6000 So notice we have 30000 invested thus far. Spread over a six-month period. Okay, so it's going to take six months to finish this project, sounds like. The project is expected to save the company $3,000 per month starting in the third month. So we have three months where we can't start collecting savings. Okay, so already it's taken three months starting in the third month. Ignoring interest and taxes, what is the payback period? Okay, in other words, how long is it going to take me to get my $29,000 back? if I'm paying $3,000 a month. So let's go to the whiteboard and work this one out. All right, here we are at the whiteboard. I wrote down the costs that we're going to invest. We're going to invest $23,000 up front, $6,000 for training. So we add those together and get $29,000. Then we take $29,000, and how long is it going to take us if we're, charging, if we're getting back $3,000 per month? So we pull out our trusty calculator here. and go $29,000 divided by $3,000 3000 equals 9.667 months okay and it took how long before we could implement this because payback starts the minute you start investing money so day one and we had to go three months so you have to add three months to nine months and uh, they're going to probably round it to whole numbers. They did, if I remember correctly. So this is either going to be 9 plus 3, which will be 12, or 9 plus, or 10, if you round it to 10, and uh, plus the 3 months. So it's either going to be 12 or 13 months. Let's go back to the question and see if that answer exists. All right, here we are, and uh, let's read that again. A Six Sigma project requires $23,000 of initial investment and training costs of 6000 spread over a six-month period. And then it says the project is expected to save 3000 per month starting in the third month. So we calculated nine or ten months. So a lot of people are going to pick nine or ten months depending on how you round it. But it's incorrect. Why? Because the payback period starts the moment you start investing money into this. And they start investing money three months before. So it's either going to be... Uh, 12 or 13 when you add the three months in uh, depending on which way you round 13 months is not an option but 12 months is so 3.7 is D all right here we are at question 14 the term metrics most frequently refers to what okay a unit of measurement could be it is a measurement so I'm not going to throw a out B the metric system no net present value uh, maybe if you meet your metrics, you'll have a good net present value, but it doesn't align to that statement. So B and C are out of there. The best one so far is A. An evaluation method, yes. You give people metrics and see if they can reach those metrics. If they do, they're doing a good job. If they exceed them, they're doing a great job. If they don't meet them, they're not doing such a good job. So it is an evaluation method. So it's either A or D, but I feel D... Uh, best aligns with the intent of this question. So 314 is D. Okay, team briefing presentations to senior management should include 
which of the following considerations? Okay, what do we know about senior management? They don't have a lot of time. So when we do work with senior management, we're supposed to do it very efficiently. We talked about that in the test taking uh, skills modules. So again, team briefing presentations to senior management should include which of the following considerations. Since the time of senior management is value, address all potential details. No. And the first part's okay, since the time of senior management is valuable, but it should say, you know, just address the main points. It says all details. That's not good. So A is out of there. B, every member of the team should have a speaking briefing role. Uh, yeah, if that works, but I'm not going to do it just so everyone can get a pat on the back. I'm in front of senior management. The most important thing is that I communicate efficiently, effectively, and get out of there because they don't have a lot of time. Okay. Okay. Identify the problem of the proposed action desired. Identify the problem in the proposed. I like that one. I really like that one. You're just getting right down to the point and getting out of there. Handout should require author's explanations. Uh, not really. I think uh, senior management just come in, tell me what I need to know, and leave because I have a lot of other things to do. And so I think it's C on this one. 4.5 is C. Okay, it is. Excessive conflict within a work team. Okay, I know this was in our example questions that we used in test taking strategies. Remember, ASQ does not like conflict, period. Has a negative effect on team members and should be avoided. I already know A is the correct one. Has a positive effect? No. Most often results in win-win? No. Engages shy member participation? No, it usually does just the opposite of that. So this one, no doubt, is A. 513, which of the following techniques has proven useful in translating customer needs into product design features? Well, what's the object, objective of QFD, quality function deployment? It is to convert customer wants, needs, and desires into product and service attributes. Well, in so many words, that is the definition of quality function deployment. So I already know the correct answer is going to be D, quality function deployment. You should remember that. They're going to test you on it every time. The objective of quality function deployment is to convert customer wants, needs, and desires into product and service attributes. So remember that one and because uh, you're bound to see it on the certification exam. So that one's D. What is the danger in bunching ideas immediately into closely related categories when using an affinity diagram? Okay, uh, remember affinity diagram, we don't have a lot of information yet, so it's going to be fairly subjective. But let's uh, see what we have here. The wrong category might be selected. I like this might be as a non-absolute. So that has something going for it. And uh, could you choose the wrong cat? I guess. I don't know, but it's easy to change it if you do. So, but let's see what else. I do like the non-absolute. Thought patterns could be biased. Yes, I like, there it is again. So we have two non-absolutes. So which one do I like better? The wrong category might be selected or thought patterns could be biased. Now, they're both possibilities, no doubt. But if the wrong category is selected, so what? You just change the heading on it. It's not a big deal. So B is a bigger deal. Thought patterns could be biased. Remember, I said this was subjective, which means bias plays a part in it. It could and probably does to some extent. So B wins out on A. Arrows might be aimed in the wrong direction. Okay, uh, whatever. I don't even know that you need arrows. But if you did, if they're aimed in the wrong direction, it's like, hey, so what? Change the direction. It's not a big deal. So B definitely it wins between A and C. The problem resolution can be overlooked. Uh, are we getting a little ahead of ourselves with the in, in affinity diagram when we, talked about, when we talk about problem resolutions? Uh, we're not even close to resolving the problem. So... This being subjective and biased in there, I would go with B. 514, is it B? Yes, it is. When performing calculations on sample data, a continuous relative frequency graph called a histogram results? I don't know. It be, depends on what kind of sample data. So, no, I don't think A is correct. 
uh, besides when I do perform calculations, calculations doesn't necessarily mean graphical, I guess it could, but there's just too many holes in A, A is out of there. Rounding the data has no effect on the mean and standard deviation. Yeah, you can round things incorrectly for one thing, um, so that could be a problem. I would throw out A though, I'd keep B before I'd throw out A. Or I mean I'd keep B, so I would throw out A. Let's look at C. Coding the data has no effect on the mean and standard deviation. No, it has an effect. I think I'm going to go to the whiteboard and go over this one a little more. Uh, because I don't think it's A or B, I really don't. And so I think it's going to be C or D. Coding and rounding affect both the mean and the standard deviation. Okay, well, let's go to the whiteboard and discuss question two. All right, here we are at the whiteboard. Uh, notice I have three numbers here, 301, 302, 303. And when I have a test question, this is usually what I do uh, when it's concerning coded data. And I already know from past experience, 1, 2, and 3 gives me a standard deviation of 1. We performed that in some of the modules. We'll do it again here. But uh, here's my data. I code it to just be 1, 2, and 3. And my average becomes 2, and my standard deviation is 1. So, it, so now let's do the non-coded data. My average is 302. So if I plug 1, 2, and 3, I get an average of 2. If I plug in 301, 302, 303, the non-coded data, I get 302. So did it change the average? Absolutely. Okay, then I take the standard deviation of the non-coded, I get 1. I take the standard deviation of the coded, I get 1. So in this case, standard deviation didn't change, uh, but the average did. So let's go back and look at the question again, see if we can find the right answer. All right, here we are back at question 2. We know it's either C or D. Coded data has no effect on the mean and the standard deviation. Well, in our example, it did change the mean, so I'd throw out C. Coded, uh, coding and rounding. Oh, I didn't see this first. Coding and rounding affect both the mean and the standard deviation. Okay, uh, we already discussed rounding can most certainly have an impact. And so, uh, on this, even on the standard deviation. Coding, we know, has a difference on the mean, but didn't have an impact on the standard deviation. But rounding will impact both of them. So that's going to be the correct answer must be D. 6.2 is D. Yes, it is. The calibration of measuring instruments is necessary to maintain accuracy. Yes, that's true. To reduce bias is to increase accuracy. Remember that. They test on that a lot. I'll say it again. Decreasing bias increases accuracy. Um, so how does calibration affect precision? It does not. They're considered to be independent of one another. The precision increases over the working range of the instrument? No. I mean, it may be true on some instrument out there, but you didn't tell me any information about the instrument. A cannot be the correct answer. The precision decreases over the working range. No. Calibration has a minimal impact on precision. That's correct. C is correct. The precision will vary over the working range of the instrument. No, it has to be C. Uh, 6.7 is C. Yes, it is. Let's go on to 7.7. .7. The reported CPK for a process with an average of 28 and a spread of 10 units. Okay, what does spread mean? Okay, here's another one. Spread means, is another words, way of saying we plus minus 3 sigma. Okay, so you have to remember the spread. We also had another term here a minute ago, the natural limits or something like that means the same as spread, uh, but you're more likely to hear the word spread on the certification exam. It means plus minus three sigmas. And upper and lower specification limits of 35 and 15 respectively would be. So they're looking for the CPK. Well, you can calculate CP upper and CP lower, but this is a time test. So you don't want to calculate both if you don't have to. How do you know which one's going to be the CP CP upper, CP lower is going to be the CPK. Well, it's which, wherever the average is closer to. Then here's the upper spec limit. How far away are they from 28 to 35? 35 minus 28 is 7. Okay, so we're 7 units away from the upper spec limit, the averages. 28 uh, and 15. 28 minus 15 is uh, 15, 25. It's going to be 13. 
So there's 13 units from 20 to the average to the lower spec limit. There's uh, only seven to the upper spec limit. So CP upper is going to be CPK. Now, some of you will get that. Some of you will not. It's okay. We're going to go to the whiteboard and draw some pictures and work this out. All right, here we are at the whiteboard, and I've drawn out the lower spec limit and the upper spec limit that was given in the problem. Then I just found the middle, right in between there, was 25. Now, the average of the distribution is 28. And I wrote 25 in here so I can get an idea of which side uh, 28 lies on. And, of course, tw what you have to ask yourself, is 28 between 25 and 15, or is 28 between 25 and 35. Of course, it's between 25 and 35. So I'm going to draw it out here. This will be the average of my distribution, which is 28. And then uh, I always draw the distribution just so I don't forget what I'm doing. And which one is the average closer to? The upper spec limit or the lower spec limit? It's closer to the upper spec limit. So if you wanted to, we could get this answer. Remember, CPK is the lower of CP upper and CP lower. I already know the lower, the CPK is going to be CP upper. But you may not know that, so we'll do both just in case. And so here is the formula, CP upper equals upper spec limit minus the average divided by three standard deviations. Now, the question said... The spread of the distribution is, what was it, 10 units, okay? What does the spread mean? It means plus minus 3. So the width of this whole distribution here, plus minus 3, is 10. Well, 3 sigma is half of that. So this is going to not be 10. 3 sigma is 5 because plus minus 3 sigma is 10. So just 3 sigma will be half of that. We'll make uh, 3 sigma equal to 5. What am I worried about here more than anything else? You have to understand that the spread means plus minus 3 sigma. And the calculation for uh, CP upper and CP lower is 3 sigmas. So it's only half of the 10 is, is going to give us 5. So hopefully you're okay with that. Now let's put in the upper spec limit is uh, 35. minus the average, which is 28. And that is going to equal, let's get out our calculator. There we go. 35 minus 28 equals, divided by 5, equals 1.4. So the CP upper is going to be 1.4. And there we have it. Now, I already know that CPK because this is a shorter distance than over here. But let's say you don't feel comfortable with that, so you just want to do the calculations. That's okay. doesn't take that long. CP lower equals average minus the lower spec limit divided by 3 sigma. Now, we remember, we know 3 sigma is equal to 5 because the spread was 10. Half of that's 5. And then the average is 28, let's put that in there, 28 minus 15, and let's get our calculator out and we'll calculate CP lower, 28 minus 15 equals, divided by 5, equals 2.6, so CP lower equals 2.6. Now remember what CPK is. That's what they ask us to calculate. CPK is the lesser of CP upper and CP lower. So the lesser is 1.4. So that will be the correct answer to this question. Let's go back to the blue page and make sure that answer is available. All right, here we are back at the blue page. And notice uh, we do have the answer B, 1.4. So that is the correct answer for question 7. We are at question 22 and it says process capability analysis is often defined as, so it's asking for a definition of process capability. 
What did I tell you in an earlier module? When they define process capability, process capability must have what associated with it? Spec limits. It always will. It has to remember the formulas, uh, upper spec limit minus average divided by three sigma. Uh, so it has to have spec limits associated with it. And it's also a probability. So probability spec limits are the two key words when you define process capability. Well, let's look through here. I don't see any spec limits there in A. I don't see any spec limits in B. Uh, specification limits in C. D, specifications. There it is. So I know already it's either C or D. So I'm not even going to read the other ones. The variability allowed by the specification limits? No. It's not what capability analysis does. Capability analysis calculates the probability, not what's allowed. You could, but it's probably not the correct answer. Let's see if D is better. The determination that the process can meet product specifications. Yes, the determination is a probability. So there you have it, probability and specifications. This one is no doubt D. Hopefully that helps you. You're going to get one of these questions on the certification exam. The probability of a train arriving on time and leaving on time is 0.8. The probability of the same train arriving on time is 0.84. The probability of this train leaving on time is 0.86. Given the train arrived on time, given that the train arrived on time, what is the probability that it will leave on time? All right, let's go to the whiteboard and work on this one. All right, welcome to the whiteboard. Let's go ahead and solve this problem. I've written down all the probabilities. The probability of a train arriving and leaving on time is 0.8. Probability of it arriving on time is 0.84. Probability of it leaving on time is 0.86. Well, this is called conditional probabilities, and this is the formula that we'll use. Probability of A, and that vertical line means given. Probability of, uh, probability of A taking place, given B has already taken place, you need to get good at saying that. The probability of A given B has already taken place equals the probability of A and B taking place divided by the probability of B. Well, let's get started then. The probability of A and B, probability of arriving and leaving. So two things happen. They only gave us one probability Well, two things happen. And that gives us 0.8. So we know that's going to go in the numerator, 0.8. So that's easy enough. Now the question is, we have two more probabilities left over. Which one goes in the denominator? Well, let's read this again. And I'm asking you, is probability of B the earlier event or the later event? Look at it again. Probability of A... What's the probability of A taking place given B has already taken place? B has already taken place. So B is the earlier probability. Which takes place earlier? The probability of arriving or the probability of leaving? It's the probability of arriving is the earlier event. So 0.84 will go in the denominator. And that's how you solve this problem. The difficult part is you don't know what goes in the denominator. Well, you do now. The denominator is the earlier of the two events. So now we can get our calculator out and uh, clear it, of course, and go 0.8 divided by 0.84. And it gives us a 95.2% chance of what? There's a 95, there's a 0.952% chance that the train will leave on time given it arrived on time. And that is the correct answer. Let's go back to the blue sheets. All right, here we are back at question 37. Remember 36 we calculated to be 0.95, and so D is the correct answer there. Three, a random sample size N is to be taken from a large population having a standard deviation of one. The sample size is to be determined so that there will be a 5% risk probability of exceeding 0.01, in other words, 5% alpha risk, a 0.1 tolerance error in using the sample mean to estimate mu. Which of the following values is nearest the required sample size? Okay, this is a very common test question, and it has to do with that formula for sample sizes. So we're going to go to the whiteboard and work this one out.
All right, here we are at the whiteboard. Here's the formula you need to know. If this is not in your formula package, please write it in there. And it says n, or sample size, equals z squared times sigma squared divided by what I call delta squared. I think in the primer they call it e or error. Um, but this is the practical significance, and that is point one. And uh, let me read that again, because... Uh, a random sample size of n is to be taken from a large population having a standard deviation of 1. Put it right there. The sample size is to be determined so that there will be a 5% alpha risk probability of exceeding the 0.1 tolerance error. Okay. So basically they're saying this is the practical significance. And the point one here, it doesn't say it's greater than or less than. It just says it wants to know if it's a difference at point one, which means plus minus. That means it's two-tailed. So when you look up the 5% alpha risk for Z, you have to look up the 2.5%. Don't forget that. It's probably one of the big reasons people miss this question. And on every ASQ exam I've ever taken, and I've taken a lot of them, it's always, with this formula, they always use the two tail. So 1.96. All right, and now once you understand that, it's just a matter of putting it in the formula, which I've uh, done here, and uh, plugging away in your calculator. So let's do that. And it's going to be 1.96 squared times 1 squared. We, are, we didn't really need to do that, did we? equals, then divided by 0.1 squared. Don't forget to square everything. That'll get you in trouble quickly. And that gives me a sample size of 384.16. Now, on these types of calculations, they'll usually round down 384. Uh, but let's go to the blue pages and see what the options are. All right, here we are back at the blue pages. And notice for the last question, the closest one there is A385. That is the correct answer. All right, uh, let's go to question 11. Determine whether the following two types of rockets have significantly different variances at the 5% level. Assume that the larger variance goes in the numerator. Okay, this is good to know because it tells us that it's a right-tailed test. On a right-tailed F test, the larger number goes in the numerator. If it's a left-tailed test, they do the inverse. Okay, so that's one thing you have to understand. And most of them on the certification exam are uh, right-tailed tests, to be honest with you. I've never had a left-tailed test on a certification exam on the F statistic. Doesn't mean it can't happen, but that's the case with this one. Another thing you need to know here, and let me ask you so you can look, is this a one-tailed or a two-tailed test? Determine whether the following two types of rockets have significantly different variances. Different. Different is a key word for a two-tailed test. If it would have said greater than or less than, it would have been a one-tailed test. But this is a two-tailed test. So you have to take that 5% alpha risk level, you have to divide it by two, and so you have to look up the critical statistic in the 2.5% alpha risk table. So that is probably the number one reason people miss this problem. All right, and it gives us rocket A, rocket B. Rocket A has 61 readings, and there's its, uh, is this its standard deviation or variance? Remember what variance is. Sigma squared equals variance. Okay, did they give us variance or standard deviations? It's very important because F equals standard deviation 1 squared or divided by standard deviation 2 squared, or variance 1 over variance 2, because standard deviation squared is variance. Well, they gave us variance. This 1,347 miles squared, how do I know it's variance? Because the units are squared, which means the number was also. So these are variances. That's another reason students miss this question, is they'll square something that's already been squared. And that'll get you in trouble. Okay, what we need to do then is go to the whiteboard and work this out. So let's go to the whiteboard. All right, here we are back at the whiteboard, and notice I've written the formulas out. Standard deviation B squared equals variance B. Remember, they gave us variance, so we don't have to square it again. 
So this is variance of B is 2,237. Since it's the larger number, it will go in the numerator on a right-tailed F test. If it was a left-tailed, it would be the inverse of this. The larger one would go in the denominator. But again, the most common one is a right-tailed test. So there it is, variance B, variance A, there's the sample sizes. We'll need that to look up our critical statistic because remember, degrees of freedom for this is N minus 1. Okay, let's uh, plug that into the formula. So F is going to equal the larger variance, 2,237, divided by the smaller one, 1,347. So let's uh, pull out the calculator here. And let's uh, calculate this. And it's going to be 2,237 divided by 1,347 equals... And that is 1.66 is the correct answer there. 1.66. Now we just need to look up the critical statistic. Now, remember it said it wanted to know if there was a difference, so it's a two-tailed test. As a result, I have to go to the 2.5% uh, alpha risk table. Remember, that's uh, unique to the F table. Uh, every table has its own alpha risk. So we have to go to the 2.5% alpha risk table. And uh, let's look at the numbers again. The enumerator has 31, and the denominator has 60. Remember, degrees of freedom for this is n minus 1. So we had 31 in the numerator, so 31 minus 1 is 30. And in the denominator, we had 61. So 61 minus 1 is 60. So where this row intersects this column, that's our critical statistic. So F critical is 1.82. All right, so here we are back at the whiteboard. Notice our F critical is 1.82 and our calculated is 1.66. Well, since our critical is greater than our calculated, we do not have enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis. In other words, there is not, uh, they are not statistically significantly different at the 5% alpha risk level. Let's go back to the blue pages. All right, here we are back at question 11 on the blue pages. Remember, we did not find a statistically significant difference. Significant difference? No. No significant difference because F calculated is less than the F tabulated. That is true. It must be B. Let's read the other ones. Uh, significant difference because F calculated is greater than F table? No. And so it's going to be B is the correct answer for 811. All right, welcome to question 24 here. If a sample size of 16 yields an average of 12, well, 16 uh, isn't 30, so we're going to have to use the T statistic here, first of all. So if a sample size of 16 yields an average of 12 and a standard deviation of 3, estimate the 95% confidence interval for the population. Well, we're all, whenever we do a confidence interval, whether we use T or Z, it's always going to be about uh, predicting the population. Assume a normal distribution. Okay, let's go to the whiteboard and work on this problem. All right, here we are at the whiteboard. And I'm just, usually on these, you don't calculate the upper confidence interval and the lower because usually you only need to do one to get the correct answer. And since it's a time test, that's what you want to do. And so we're just going to first start off with the upper confidence interval. If we need the lower, we'll calculate it in a little bit. Okay, so the formula is X bar plus T. Why did I use T instead of Z? Because the sample size was 16. Less than 30, you use T. So there it is. Uh, times the standard deviation over the square root of n. Remember, when they ask for confidence intervals, you're taking a confidence interval of the average. Uh, if it's a single event, they have another name for it. It's called uh, estimate interval or something like that. Okay, so I wrote down what we know. We know x bar to be 12. We know standard deviation to be 3. We know the sample size to be 16. And we know the degrees of freedom is 16 minus 1, n minus 1 which gives us 15. So let's go to the t-table and look up the t-statistic. Now it will be a two-tailed and uh, let's look at this real quick because I can't remember. Yeah, it's two-tailed and it's 5%, so we're going to look up a 2.5% alpha risk. 
uh, for, for any confidence interval that's always two-tailed. So let's go to our t-table and look this up. So here we are at the t-table. There's our degrees of freedom of 15, and we want a 2.5%, uh, and that's 2.131. Let's go back to the whiteboard. All right, here we are back at the whiteboard, and so let's get started. Uh, we have all our information. We just need to plug the numbers in now, so let's get to work on that. Uh, let's replace the X bar with 12. And our T, we know to be 2.131. And then our standard deviation is 3. And we're going to divide that by the square root of N, which is the square root of 16. All right, now let's uh, calculate the t times standard deviation first. So let me get our calculator out here. And I'm going to go 3 divided by 16 square root equals 0 0.75. 0 0.75 times t, 2.131. Equals, and let me write that down so it makes it a little easier for us. Okay, and uh, that was my answer from doing that math. Now let's add it to the average, and that will give us our upper confidence interval. which is 13.598, so we'll write that down. Now that's our upper confidence interval. If we need the lower one, we'll just have to subtract from that. But like I say, on a timed exam, you usually only do one because that's usually all you need. Let's go back to the blue pages and see if we can get this correct. All right, here we are back at the blue pages. And notice we had 13.598, and uh, the closest one to that is 13.6. So there's no other repeat. If there was two 13.6s, we'd have to go back and calculate the lower one. But no need here. We know the correct answer is A. Let's move on to the next question. And it's question 25. In order to test whether the average output of one machine is the same or greater than another machine. So this is a one-tailed test. A sample of 10 pieces was taken from each. The calculated T value turned out to be 1.767. Okay, so they already calculated it for us. Using a one-tailed test with a significance level of 5%, one concludes that. Okay, this seems like a pretty easy one. So let's go to our T table and figure out what our T critical is. All right, so here we are at the whiteboard. And N1 equaled 10, N2 equaled 10. They had 10 of each in this study. And uh, for this type of problem, we go N1 plus N2 minus 2 uh, is the one. Sometimes this is an estimate. This is actually for pooled standard deviation, but we use it throughout the ASQ exam for these type of t-test questions. Because the other uh, degrees of freedom was that skyscraper formula that we don't want to use on a time test, nor does ASQ expect you to use that one on the test. They expect you to use this. So 10 plus 10 minus 2 is 18, so we have 18 degrees of freedom. Uh, and let me see what else we need to know here, because I forgot. A one-tailed test, it says. So we're going to look up 5% alpha risk at 18 degrees of freedom. So let's go to our T-table. So here we are at our T-table, and we have 18 degrees of freedom. And uh, this was a one-tailed test, so T critical is going to be 1.734. So you'll want to write that down. I'm going to write it down so I don't forget it. 1.734 is the critical statistic. Now let's go back and compare that to the calculator. All right, here we are back at the blue page, and uh, there it is, 1.67, and our critical was 1.734. So our calculated is greater than our critical, so we have enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis. So to, the obtained T ratio does not fall within the critical region. 
Uh, no, it does fall in the critical region. Critical region is the region where you reject it. If the value is in the shaded region, you know, reject it. The critical value is what borders that. So the border would be 1.67, or the border would be 1.734, and our calculated is greater than that, so it's in the critical region. So it does not fall in. No, it does fall within the critical region. There was no significant difference between the means. No, there most certainly is. The null hypothesis was rejected. That is the correct answer. And C is the correct answer for question 25. 837, the current process produces 50 units per shift. A new process has yielded 52 units per shift for 16 straight shifts. That's pretty good. Uh, but that's not much of a difference, 50 to 52, with a standard deviation of 4 units per shifts. What is the level of confidence that the process has changed? Okay, so we need to do an uh, inference study here. And what kind of inference study is it going to be? What is the level of confidence that the process has changed? Okay, let's go to the whiteboard and work this one out. All right, here we are at the whiteboard, and this is a T inference study. We have two averages and a standard deviation, a sample size of 16 shifts, if you recall. So this is the formula we will use. And on average, we had 52 with the new process, 50 with the old process. The standard deviation was 4, and it was for 16 straight shifts. So 16 is the sample size. Well, if we go 52 minus 50, that's 2. 4 divided by the square root of 16. Square root of 16 is 4, so 4 over 4 is 1. So we get down here, and <laughs> I put x bar there. That should be t. So t is 2 over 1 equals 2. Now, that's not the question. It asks, what was our confidence? And it wanted to know the difference. Well, difference means a two-tailed test. So we have to keep that into account also. So as I said, this is a little bit of a different problem uh, in that we have to determine the confidence here. And we remember we had 16, and the degrees of freedom for that formula is n minus 1. So 16 minus 1 is 15. So this is the row we'll be working with, and we're looking for something between 2. So we start out here, 2.258, 0.691, 0.866. Uh, 2 is right between these two numbers which just happens to be 5% alpha risk and 2.5% alpha risk. However, remember, this was two-tail, so when you go out of the table, this means 5% and 10%. So it's between 5 and 10%. So remember that as we go back to the blue pages. It's between 5 and 10% uh, alpha risk. All right, here we are back to the blue pages, and notice we have, uh, they didn't do it in alpha, uh, they did it in confidence because it said level of confidence changed. So remember, it was 5 to 10 percent. Well, 5 would be 95, 10 would be 90, so the correct answer is B. Now, if you would have solved this as a one-tailed problem, you would have ended up with that as the correct answer. How did I know it was a two-tailed problem? Because uh, what is the level of confidence that the process has changed? Is, is there a difference? It doesn't say greater than or less than. That's how I knew it was two-tailed. And then I, once I looked it up in the t-table, that's a one-tailed, so I have to multiply that by 2 when I bring it out of the table. And that gives me my 90 and 95. So that's kind of a tricky one. I mean, imagine many of you will, would miss that one. So be careful. Look for those two-tailed and one-tailed tests. You cut it in half, the alpha risk, when it's two-tailed going into the table. When you're bringing it out of the table, you have to multiply it by 2. All right, 46, it is desirable to reduce the variation in a process. Okay, very good. The current variance is known to be 6. Okay, notice they just gave you a standard deviation. They didn't give you the number of sample size. They, it's, they're basically giving you uh, the population variance. Notice they also said variation, not standard deviation. So those are things you have to be careful of on these types of test questions. The current variance is known to be 6. The new process yielded a standard deviation of 2. Well, that's from 6 to 2. Sounds pretty good. For 25 trials, what is the chi-squared calculated? Okay, this isn't too bad. Let's go to the whiteboard and work this out. 
but first I want you to know they asked for the chi-squared, so they told you this is chi-squared. How do we know it's chi-squared? Well, you have two statistics that you can use to uh, determine a difference in standard deviation, two competing statistics, f and chi-squared. Well, f has to have two sample sizes because it has a degrees of freedom across the first row and degrees of freedom. You need two degrees of freedom to use the table. If it, you only have one degree of freedom, you can only use chi-squared. Well, they gave us, the current variance is known to be 6. Okay, they gave you, didn't give you how many trials. So you, they did on this other one, so you only have one set, one, pot, one degree of freedom to work with. Well, you have to use the chi-squared table in that case. That's how I knew this was chi-squared. When they gave me a variance, they may give you a standard deviation, but they gave me a variance without any, how many numbers they used to calculate that that forces it to chi-squared. Let's go to the whiteboard and work this one. All right, welcome to the whiteboard where we're working on question 46. This is kind of a tricky question, to be honest with you, uh, because the test question, I don't know if I read it right the first time, but uh, I read it again and realized that uh, they gave us uh, one standard deviation for the sample they did on the new process, and they gave us a standard deviation. On the population value, it was a variance. So, with that being said, here's the formula, chi-squared equals n minus 1 times uh, sample standard deviation squared. That's the new standard deviation that they're comparing the old one to. And uh, divided by sigma squared. Now, they already gave us variance for the denominator. It's very tricky, but they gave a standard deviation for the numerator. So, I wrote all that down here, and then I put it in the equation. Sample size is 25 minus 1. Uh, times standard deviation squared. They gave us standard deviation, so we have to square it. However, in the denominator, it's sigma squared, and they gave us variance, so it's already been squared. So you can see they're being a little bit tricky here. And guess what? They're going to do the same thing on the certification exam. So you have to read those questions very carefully, especially when it comes to variance and standard deviation. Some, a lot of people would have put two or 6 is the standard deviation, they would have squared it again. That will give you the wrong answer every time. So again, be very careful when you're reading these questions and differentiate between standard deviation and variance because they'll try to trick you on those. All right, and you've studied too hard to miss, uh, to fail the exam based on such uh, silly, tricky test questions. All right, let's go get our calculator and get this uh, figured out. So there we go, 25 minus 1, which we already knew to be 24, uh, times 2 squared, times 2 squared equals. So the value of the numerator is 96 divided by 6. Remember, it's already been squared. They gave us variance. Equals 16. So the correct answer is 16. Let's go back to the blue pages and make sure that that is an option. All right, here we are back at the blue pages, uh, question 46. I want to read through this again so you can pick out the tricks. It is desirable to reduce the variation in the process. So if this is an inference study, which it ends up being, it's either going to be F test or chi-squared test, chi-squared parametric test. The current variance is known to be 6. Aha. And all they gave you was the value of the variance, which is sigma squared, remember, is 6. There's no sample size or anything, so we can't use the F. This is a chi-squared study now, and we know it. A new process yielded a standard deviation of 2 for 25 trials. There we have one sample size, so we can go uh, 25 minus 1 is 24 degrees of freedom, and we can use the chi-squared table. We can't use the F table. Why? Because it demands two sets of degrees of freedom, a set of two degrees of freedom, one for the earlier process, one for the later process. So this is definitely chi-squared. We already did the calculation. We know that C is the correct answer. All right, here we are at question 22. The advantage of using the modern designed method of experimentation, DOE, rather than the classical. What was the classical? One at a time. Well, one at a time, if you have 10 variables, you have to change one at a time, and you have, what, 10 runs, I guess but you'll never pick up on interactions. That's the big problem. So, the advantage of using the modern design method of experimentation rather than the classical is that everything is held constant except for the factor under investigation. 
No, that is the classical kind. And they're asking for the advantage. The, that's not an advantage. Experimental error is recognized but need not be stated in quantitative terms. Yes, it needs to be stated in quantitative terms. It's okay to take risk, but you need to quantify risk wherever possible. Fewer terms and measurements are needed for valid and useful information. This is true. And it's also a very common test question on an ASQ exam. But C is correct. The sequence of measurement is often assumed to have no effect. No, that's not true. You should do MSAs before you do DOEs to make sure you don't have a measurement problem. So 922 is no doubt C. The repeated trials in a designed experiment allow for what? The repeated trials in a designed experiment allow for what? First order modeling. Well, if I remember correctly, first order modeling means the main effects. Uh, you may want to look that up to make sure, but that doesn't fit this uh, intent. Determination of experimental error. Yes, you must have repeats to, experiment, uh, to de calculate experimental error because experimental error is based on what? Standard error or standard deviation. And you can't do that with one number, so you have to do replicates to get the, the experimental error. So B, I think, is probably the correct one. Nested experimentation, I think that's when everything's in the same column, but I'm not, if I remember correctly, it doesn't fit the intent of this. The resolution of main effects, uh, yeah, that would definitely help with resolution, I would imagine. So I have a problem here, it's somewhat of a hair splitter. B, determination of experimental error or the resolution of main effects. Okay. And uh, I can see it going either way, but uh, you may get some resolution. You will get resolution of main effects without repeatability, but you can definitely improve resolution. But you cannot do experimental error without uh, repeated trials. So 941 is B. Here we are at question 53. Plackett-Berman experimental designs are called screening designs. This is true. A screening design can be defined as an experiment with interactions among the main effects. No, Plackett-Berman is incapable of picking up on interactions, as are most other screening designs, if not all. The use of a non-geometric experimental design. Okay, I, I believe uh, it's still a geometric experimental design. An identification of the key input factors. Okay, a screening design can be defined as an identification of key input factors. Okay, it will study key input factors. I don't like any of these all that well, to be honest with you. A fractional factorial experiment. It is fractional, but fractional is less, uh, you throw away less runs usually. So there's a, there's a difference between fractional and screening. Half fractional screening is highly fractionalized. So I, I think on this one it is C, but it's worded kind of funny. So let's look that up. 53 is at C, and yes it is. A process is in control with a p-bar of 0 0.10 and a sample size of 100. I'm assuming sample size is constant. The three sigma limits of the NP control chart are, okay, you're going to get these types of questions. So you'll need to go and look up the control limit formulas, and I want you to do that. Maybe put this on pause. Make sure you can find those, because if you can't, you're going to be in trouble in the test. In the meantime, I'm going to go over to the whiteboard and write those formulas out and get ready to solve this problem. But make sure you know where to find these. Let's go to the whiteboard. All right, here we are at the whiteboard. Notice I wrote the formula out. This is going to be a time test, so I'm not going to calculate the upper control limit and the lower control limit if I don't have to. That could, you know, approximate double the time. So I'm just going to do one, see if I can get the correct answer. I always use the uh, upper control limit because I get to add and subtract. It just makes it a little easier on my calculator uh, moves. Okay, so this is the formula, np bar plus three times the square root of np bar times one minus p bar. Uh, make sure you can find that in your formula sheet. If, you, if it's not there, write it in there. Remember, we want all the formulas in one place, so you don't have to look throughout the, the primer. And P bar was a given of uh, 0.10 or 10%. N sample size equals 100. It is constant because they ask us to 
calculate the NP chart, and the NP chart demands constant sample size. P chart does not, if you'll recall. Okay, what is, now we have to calculate NP bar. Well, NP bar is a formula, N times P bar. Okay, so N is 100, P bar is 0 0.10. I multiply both of those to get NP bar. That's 10. That, what does that mean? It means on average, I get 10 bad parts per subgroup. All right. Now, let's put those numbers into our formula. So NP bar, like I said, is 10. So there's my 10 for NP bar, plus 3 times the square root of NP bar. There's my 10 again, times 1 minus P bar, which is 1 minus 0 0.10. And now let's just pull our calculator out and uh, start crunching numbers. So 1 minus uh, 0.10, of course, is 0 0.9 times 10 equals 9 square root equals 3. So this whole square root thing is equal to 3 times 3 equals 9 plus 10 equals 19. Of course, you'll probably be able to do a lot of that in your head and do it much quicker than we just did. And that's good. Uh, but let's go back to the blue pages and see if this is one of the options. So here we are back at the blue pages, and notice uh, there is a 19. I believe that's what we calculated it is, and uh, that is the correct answer. All right, here we are at question 12. An X bar and R chart was prepared for an operation using 20 samples with five pieces in each sample. That's good. Remember, they'll test you on that sometime. You need to have at least 20 subgroups before you uh, calculate the upper and lower control limit. It should be over a reasonable amount of time to where the average has time to fluctuate and everything. And so all is good thus far. X bar was found to be 33.6 and R bar was uh, 6.20. When, when they start throwing out numbers, it means you're going to have to do some calculations. I was surprised that there's not numbers down here for answers. But let's read on. During production, a sample of five was taken and the pieces measured, these numbers, at the time this sample was taken. Both the average and range were within control limits. Neither the average nor range were within control limits, etc., etc. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to ca have to calculate the upper and lower control limit on both the average and range chart, calculate this sample and range from this sample, sample average and sample range, and see how it relates to those control limits. Well, this is going to demand that we go to the whiteboard. Let's go to the whiteboard and work this out. All right, here we are at the whiteboard. Notice I wrote everything out. We're going to use an X bar R chart. That was a given in the problem. They gave us X double bar of 33.6. They gave us R bar of 6.20. We need to calculate the upper and lower control limit and the upper control limit is X double bar plus A2 times R bar. I wrote these down, but make sure you can find those formulas and you can find them quickly and you feel good about it, confidently. Okay, and lower control limit equals X double bar minus A2 times R bar. So we, and I looked up A2 from the constant table for SPC, it's 0.577. And uh, once we have that, I put everything in here, X double bar, 33.6. And they may just give you average in the question. You use what they give you. We assume it's X double bar, 33.6 plus A2. I looked up in the table of 5.577, R bar of 6.20. Now, the only difference between upper and lower control limit is instead of adding A2 times R bar, you're subtracting A2 times R bar. Remember, A2 times R bar equals three sigmas, three sigmas of the averages. If they gave, they could give you different uh, numbers here to where you don't have everything you need. They just give you sigma. Well, and they give you sample size. Then you go three times sigma over the square root of n is going to give you the same thing. They do that sometimes. Uh, most people are trained on these old formulas, but the new ones are more accurate. What's the new one? X double bar plus three times sigma of individuals divided by the square root of n. But in this case, they gave us everything we need for this traditional formula that Schuert created. So let's go ahead and punch those numbers in and see what we get for an upper and lower control limit. So 6.20 times 
3.577. 3.57. So when you do these where you have to calculate the upper and the lower control limit, always write down the value of 3 sigma so you don't have to calculate it twice. So this is uh, 3.577. which is what? Equal to three sigmas right there. Three sigmas of what? Averages or single events? Averages. Uh, eight two times R bar is for sigma of averages. Okay, now we just simply add that plus 33.6 equals 37.1774. So the upper control limit equals 37.1774. 1774. Oh, and I erased, I erased my three sigma thing there that I told you to write down. But that's okay, I'll, I'll plug it in again. But remember, on the time test, you don't want to plug it in again, so you want to uh, keep that written down, which you'll have to in the test anyway. So I'm going to go 0 0.577 times 6.20 equals. 3.5774. There it is. I couldn't remember it at first, but that sounds right. 3.5774. And then I'm going to subtract that from the average, so 33.6 minus 3.5774. 3.5774 equals uh, basically 30. 30. Point 0226. And I have students ask me a lot, well, what do I round, at, round to uh, on these ASQ exams? And I've overdone it here. Usually you look and say, okay, there's two decimal points. I'm going to go out three. And so I went out four. But uh, if you go out and if you use that rule, you're going to be just fine on the ASQ exam. All right, now that we know the upper and lower control limit for the averages chart, let's go ahead and go to the range chart and calculate the upper and lower control limit for that. So here we are, the formulas for upper control limit of the range is D4 times R bar, lower control limit is D3 times R bar. I looked up D4, remember you should be able to find these equations easily and confidently uh, before you go take the test. I looked up D4 is 2.114, D3 for a sample size of 5. How did I get sample size of 5? They gave me 5 numbers in that sample group, uh, and that's how I knew it was 5. D3 equals 0 when a sample size is 5. Remember, it will always e equal 0 until I believe the sample size gets above 7. I have it out right here. Let me see. Uh, D3. Yes, at 7, it starts taking upon itself a number other than 0. That's the D3 value there. So be aware of that. It's not always 0, just if it's uh, less than 7 sample size. Okay, with that being said, they already gave me the range earlier. I wrote that down earlier. And so upper control limit of the range equals my D4 value times my R bar, which is 6.20 right there. So let's go ahead and plug that in. 2.114 times 6.20 R bar equals 13.1068. Okay, that's the upper control limit. I should write that right there. Okay, and then, of course, the lower control limit is multiplied by zero, so it's going to be zero. That's an easy one. All right. Now we know our upper and lower values of our upper and lower control limits. Now we need to go back to that subgroup, calculate the average, calculate the uh, range, and then see how that lies within these control limits. All right, so I wrote down those numbers that they gave us, and I calculated the average and the range high minus low there, and then I look at that and say, okay, where does the average lie on the control limits? Uh, does it lie within or outside? Well, 35.8 lies uh, right in there. It's a little bit above the average, which would be 33.5 something. 
but it lies within the control limits. But 18, range of 18, lies what? Above the upper control limit. So the range shows special cause. Average does not. Let's go back to the blue pages and see if, that, uh, if we can find the correct answer. All right, here we are back at the blue pages, and uh, let's see, read these and see which one is the correct answer. Both the average and range are within the control limits. No, the average was, the range was not. Neither the average nor the range were within control limits. No, the average was within control limits. Only the average was outside control limits. No, so it must be D. Only the range was outside the control limits. This is true. So the correct answer for question 12 is D. All right, here we are at question six. The most effective and efficient method of solving quality problems for a product is to concentrate areas in which, concentrate efforts in which area? Well, this is an easy one. We've been teaching this from day one of the class, and it's going to be A, design. And you'll be asked that question on every ASQ exam. So hopefully you can get that one right, probably on multiple occasions. Okay, production, no, quality improvement, uh, well, quality improvement could be part of design, but axiomatic design, so it's kind of a hair splitter, uh, but no, quality improvement in design, if it would say quality improvement in design, then we would have a real hair splitter, but this one is no doubt A. Let's move on to the next question. Seven, question seven, the principal purpose of robust design techniques is to do what? To make things robust. Okay. Make the product less sensitive to noise effects. Yes, that's true. So it's probably A. Use the tools of experimental design. No, there's, uh, although it is a big deal to create robust design using that, but the ultimate objective is to create less sensitive products. Reduce the sources of variation. Uh, not necessarily. You create the design to where it can handle the variation of the environment. Improve manufacturing quality. Now, the whole thing about robustness is make the product less sensitive to noise effects. So 11.7 is going to be A. Congratulations, you have completed this video. As you can see, I have a lot of experience in ASQ certification exams. I've passed most of the certification exams myself. If you have any questions or, or comments, please contact me at alphatc.com. Again, that's alphatc.com for Alpha Training and Consulting. And uh, I look forward to hearing from you. Once you get on the website, go to contact us, send me a message. I'll get back with you as soon as possible. Thank you, and have a great day. Goodbye.